Mark of the Ninja was released in 2012 by Clay Entertainment. In 2018 it received an HD remaster. That's the version I'd recommend. That's also the greatest stealth game I've ever played. I have a bit of a bad gaming habit where I'll skip every cutscene without giving them much of a chance, so here's my quick spoiler-free review of the story. It's worth watching the cutscenes. You play as a ninja who's accepted a mark which grants power, but will eventually drive him insane. Once his mission is done, he must commit suicide to prevent himself from killing everyone around him. His mission? To bring down Hessian Services, a mercenary group with a vendetta against your clan. This premise lends itself well to a stealth game. Also, the hero being doomed from the start should generate some sympathy or intrigue. Admittedly, I have a soft spot for revenge plots, but the premise isn't the only thing going for it. Your clan, the last bastion of the traditional ninja way in the modern world, is under attack by Hessian services. Thus begins the first area, Hisumo Joe. This area is literally an inspired design, inspired by the designer's time in Tokyo, and the quiet shrines in the midst of a bustling city. Hey, you. Don't you hear the bell? Mark of the Ninja combines the appeal of stealth and puzzle games. It presents you with a clear problem, then tests you on it. This might sound like something that every stealth game ever has done, but it's not. Mark of the Ninja excels at conveying information. While every game tries to show you what you're up against, no others do this as well and as quickly. The game goes out of its way to provide the player with information. Many other games are plagued by unintentional mysteries. Will that guard be able to see me? Are there guards around this corner? Will this item distract this guard? Are they too far away? How hidden am I right now? I've never had to ask these questions thanks to Mark of the Ninja's visual clarity. Guards have clear vision cones and flashlights. You know exactly what each guard can see. Your distant third-person view means you can view everything around you easily. Even if a guard's on the other side of a wall, you can still see their footsteps. You know exactly what's going on around you. Your tools show exactly how far their noise will go. You know if something will distract a guard or not. Everything is either light or dark, no in-between. When someone is in shadow, they turn black with white outlines. You know how hidden you are. Every new room you encounter, you are immediately shown what obstacle you're facing and you can immediately strategize. Many other stealth games prioritize exploration over puzzles, which is fine, but it introduces problems. When you make a stealth game like this more open, it usually makes it far too easy, since any problem can be tackled from any angle. One of those angles won't provide a challenge. The obvious solution to this is to introduce barriers and roadblocks, creating a frustrating maze. Despite linear becoming a bit of a dirty word in game design lately, Mark of the Ninja uses its mostly linear level design excellently, being neither too easy nor a maze. Thanks to this linearity, the level designers have more control over how a player will encounter every room. The rooms can be curated to provide the desired difficulty. Mark of the Ninja's perspective is perfect for this level design, opting for a 2D side-scroller, rather than the dominant top-down or over-the-shoulder. If you wanted to keep the linearity in a different perspective, lots of barriers would be necessary. This risks feeling contrived and railroady, but in a side-scroller, linearity is perfectly natural. This perspective also means that guards must rigidly face left or right, which might seem like a negative, but works amazingly. The game requires you to be behind a guard to stealth kill them, and you're usually punished severely for just being in front of a guard. Note how stealth games in different perspectives, where guards can face a variety of directions, either give you some ability to hide in plain sight, or a ranged weapon. But Mark of the Ninja can impose this challenge and have it be fair. Proponents of more open stealth games might argue that they provide much more options, allowing everyone to play their own unique way, yada yada. I actually agree, but I've never missed that level of freedom when playing Mark of the Ninja, since it already provides more than enough options. Sure, encounters will usually be in the same order for everyone, but the way you tackle those encounters will be unique. The inclusion of a scoring system is critical. If there were no scoring, players would gravitate towards whatever strategy is easiest. But since there are points, how are you going to get them? Distraction? Undetected? Terrorized? Body hidden? Quick kills? Kills with setup? No kills? Item kills? What items to equip? What style to equip? Throughout the game, you'll unlock styles by completing challenges. Each one provides a unique bonus and detriment. Styles are especially effective at encouraging variety. I'll admit, I tend to find one playstyle I like and stick to it, but when I choose a style, it significantly affects my playstyle. For example, your default style, the Path of the Ninja, is a jack of all trades. The Path of Silence suits a pacifist run. The Path of Nightmare suits a kill everything attitude with a focus on terrorizing and friendly fire. Switching it up is easy with the style system, even for me. This is all tied together by how quick the gameplay can be. This is largely accomplished through the excellent level design. Too many games have too much of their playtime in simply traveling to wherever the next encounter is. In Mark of the Ninja, you'll dispatch some guards, go to the next room, and are immediately up against the next challenge. This speed is retained even in death. Checkpoints are frequent and fast. I know I just praised the speed of the gameplay, but when you start out, it's a different story. I still remember my first playthrough. 
Getting three stars on a level could be a nightmare, and I actually recall rage quitting at some sections I found particularly challenging, but I kept coming back. I wanted to beat it, and I did, many times. Now the game is a breeze. Or maybe I just sucked, who knows. In any case, it's extremely satisfying to master the art of jumping over enemy sightlines, and other such techniques. When I called Mark of the Ninja the greatest stealth game I have ever played, that was no exaggeration, and I've played a lot of stealth games. It might seem like hyperbole, since it's a fairly humble game and there are absolutely stealth games out there that are bigger, longer, and have more content, but there are none that come close to Mark of the Ninja in polished, engaging gameplay. The puzzle-like challenges, incremental level design, variety of options, quick gameplay, and high skill ceiling combine to make this game hyper-replayable and unmatched. And we haven't even finished the first level. Back to that. In the end cutscene of the first level, there's this line. You picked the wrong guys to rob, Sensei. It's time for the old man to retire, boys. Now, I'd feel bad about singling out one voice, but this guy's attempt at an Australian accent is so bad it breaks my immersion every time I hear him talk. His voice stands out even more since I think every other character is voiced well. As I, the head of the clan, decides to strike back, you attack Hessian services on their own turf, beginning the Oshi City area, your only aid being your companion, Aura. The boss of Hessian services, Karajan, is portrayed excellently. He's brimming with confidence that you're not a threat. It really motivates you to prove him wrong. Karajan's right-hand man, that Australian guy, is portrayed interestingly. He knows you're a threat, but is still fiendishly loyal to Karajan, despite knowing he's wrong. This conflict is never really explored. Maybe because Clay didn't want a sympathetic assassination target, or maybe they didn't want to give him the screen time. Oshi City is by far the most generic of the areas. This is apparently because it was the first area that started development. This was before the story was fleshed out, so the designers didn't have much to work with. Ideally, this area could have been more unique, but the game suffers very little from this area's basic premise. Since it's the first real area, everything is more unfamiliar. In each level, you earn points to increase your score. Getting a high enough score will earn you stars, up to a maximum of three per level. These stars can be spent on upgrades. Very little would change if there are no upgrades, and you just had these abilities by default. There is the attraction of wanting to try out each new toy you buy, increasing variety slightly. Even though I personally got very little out of these upgrades, I can't call them a failure. It's not hard to unlock everything you want, and upgrades stay with you even if you play an earlier level. So, the upgrades are of little impact, but the scoring system used to get those upgrades is a different story. I already praised scoring for giving the player more to do than just reach the end of the level. Unfortunately, scoring is still flawed. Trying to achieve the highest score you can is an exercise in tedium and pain. By my count, there are only five things that influence your score. 1. Score penalties, like being detected or a body being found. 2. Objectives and collectibles, stuff that you find and interact with, like finding scrolls or unlocking doors. 3. Completion bonuses, like no alarms raised or no enemies killed. 4. Kill bonuses, different methods of killing guards will award 400 to 600 points. 5. Guard bonuses, other stuff you can do to guards, like undetected or terrorized. The first three are fine, but kill and guard bonuses are poorly implemented. When you kill a guard, you obviously want to get a kill that will earn the most points, 600. Usually, these are the hardest kills to get, like Hangman's Hymn or Friendly Fire. The problem being, Ninja Tool kills also award 600 points, despite them being easy kills to get. Just throw something at a guard and watch him die. Some levels feature a resupply, which allows you to change your gear and restock it. It allows you to infinitely restock your items, which can kill guards for maximum points. So, if you want to try for a high score, you'll be making a lot of item kills, and must backtrack to the resupply every time you run out. Guard bonuses also have horrible implications. To maximize points, every guard must be undetected, distracted, disabled, terrorized, and have their body hidden. In short, that is not fun. Just hiding bodies can be tedious. Watch how long it takes to hide the bodies from this one room. This is in the first level. Now that I've sufficiently explained why trying for a high score is miserable, let me tell you why it doesn't matter. In the original Mark of the Ninja, there's a leaderboard for each level. This was removed, probably because the top was filled with hackers, or because they realized hunting high scores wasn't fun, or maybe sorting out networking was more trouble than it was worth. In the remaster, the only thing your score does is earn new stars, but once you've earned all three stars for a level, your score in that level does literally nothing. I believe the game doesn't even keep track of your high scores. In conclusion, I wish that trying for a high score was fun, but it doesn't need to be. Oshi City ends with assassinating Corporal Kangaroo, but Karjan escapes to his castle stronghold in Eastern Europe. Thus begins the Hessian castle area. 
but tattoo artist Dosan gives you the second mark. He complains the ink isn't fresh and says he'll go to the source for more. An Eastern European castle makes for a novel backdrop for a ninja, and appropriately increases the difficulty. Over the course of the area, you slowly back Karjan into a corner. In Hessian Castle, you're granted Farsight, which permanently occupies down on the D-pad. You also select your items via the D-pad, but Farsight doesn't behave like those other items. Instead of holding the focus button, aiming, and pressing Y, you just press Y, and you can't be focusing. This isn't terrible, but it is inelegant. Left bumper is conspicuously the only gamepad button that doesn't do anything. This was originally meant to be the sneak button, and you would just walk if you weren't holding it. In a stealth game, sneaking should just be default, so merging walking and sneaking is great design. That being said, this empty button is a waste. I would suggest a dedicated farsight button. This is far more elegant than farsight being an item that acts unlike every other item. Giving farsight a dedicated button would be worth it, if only for the reduced switching between items you'd have to do. Mark of the Ninja's visuals are excellent, but it's a bit of a miracle they came out looking this good. In the commentary, an artist complained about how his tools to make the game look good were taken away from him. The Marked Ninja had to be animated with tweens so that the different character costumes could be worn, so he couldn't traditionally animate a fluid main character. Everything must be rigidly light or dark, no in-between, so he couldn't use creative lighting. The level elements had to be made individually so they could be moved around when the level was adjusted, so he couldn't paint the level as one unit. All these were luxuries Clay had for their previous games, Shank 1 and 2. Personally, Shank is definitely more visually impressive than Mark of the Ninja, but as far as I'm concerned, these concessions for better gameplay were absolutely the correct choice, especially since the game still manages to look good. If you're watching this video, you can admire the art style for yourself, so I won't explain everything, but I will point out some highlights. If his backstory didn't already convince you that the marked ninja is cool, all you need to do is look at him. The character designers nailed the aesthetic of a man equally capable of sneaking past a guard and chopping him in half. There are several unique portraits for the main menu, I can't pick a favorite. Every cutscene is fully animated. When I'm replaying a level, I like watching the cutscenes just to admire the art, but you can still skip every cutscene, even pause it. Honestly, being able to skip and pause cutscenes should just be standard by now, but it's still nice. The level select menu is amazing. Each level being a unique building and each area having a unique background is a great touch. Makes the game feel more like a journey. I also appreciate that each level has a short recap in case you took a break and lost the plot. The kill animations are immensely well done, and that's coming from someone who isn't a big fan of execution animations. In Doom, I found them irritating. In Mark of the Ninja, I find them satisfying. Perhaps quantity is the culprit. In a playthrough, you'll kill far less enemies in Mark of the Ninja than in Doom. Then again, maybe this is because of the animation's context and build-up. Instead of just running up to someone, you have to be a bit clever and sneak up to them. My favorite has to be assassinating Karajan. It's got all this build-up. He underestimated you. You've backed him into a corner. He's hiding in a safe room. Karajan is terrified. You work your way in there. When you get to him, you don't sneak. You confidently walk right up to Karajan. He's helpless in the dark. The animation caps it all off. After killing Karajan, your mission is complete. You must commit suicide before you're driven insane by the mark. But as I steals Karajan's technology and uses it for the clan, abandoning its traditional ways, the marked ninja doesn't appreciate this and betrays the clan. Then, for reasons I don't fully understand, the marked ninja travels to Tabriz, in Iran. Thus begins the ruins area. The recap for the first level of the ruins reads, there's no one to turn to, except Dosan, who has gone to Tabriz, the source of the clan's ink. Why does the Marked Ninja even bother going? He's basically declared war on his clan, and he wants to kill his former master. But he was just in the same room with said former master, and he ran away, even though he could have killed him right there. Maybe that wouldn't be honorable. Okay, fine. Even though it's not like ninjas are above deception, I can accept that maybe he wanted to betray his clan honorably. But why go to Iran? He ends up going right back to his clan's headquarters anyway. If you think I'm nitpicking, it doesn't even bother me how he managed to travel from Eastern Europe to Iran. Maybe this irritates me so much because the more you think about the rest of the story, it gets better, or at least holds up, but not here. Aside from the Iran thing, Mark the Ninja's story has one big flaw. It takes too long to get interesting. Throughout the Yoshi City and Hessian Castle areas, it's a straightforward kill the bad guy plot. Only once you beat Hessian Castle does it become unique, when the Marked Ninja betrays his clan. I imagine plenty of people gave the story a chance, but stopped paying attention before it got interesting. I can't say I blamed them. A game's camera is generally something you only think about when it malfunctions, so let me praise Mark of the Ninjas for a bit. 
Instead of always having the marked ninja in the center of the screen, the camera automatically focuses on the nearest room. This works great because you probably don't want to focus on the walls between rooms. Rooms are somewhat isolated challenges, so what you do in one room won't affect the other rooms, aside from notably alarms. The camera reinforces this by showing you the room you're in and not bothering with much else. The level designers were also wise to have few rooms larger than the screen. It's a nice touch that the right analog stick still gives you some camera control. There's basically no downside to implementing this, since without it, the right analog stick would just be wasted space. The finale of the game comes full circle, back at Hisomu Jo. This area only has two levels. The first is a regular level, the second is basically one long cutscene. Another game might have merged the two, but I'm glad they didn't, since you might want to replay the stealth challenge, but not want the story stuff. The first level of the two is excellent, providing the final and most difficult stealth gauntlet. Your hallucinations have manifested, providing appropriately climactic and trippy visuals. Then, the final narrative level. You finally reach his eye to kill him, but before you do... Who are you listening to? Have the hallucinations grown so strong? The voice you hear is temptation. After some pretty visuals, you have a choice. Kill Aura and yourself, or his eye and the clan. Does Azai deserve to die? He stole gear from Karajan, and in the process he abandoned the clan's traditional way. Come to think of it, why were you attacking Karajan? You picked the wrong guys to rob, Sensei. Was Karajan just retaliating against the clan for their theft? But if Azai really did just want new tech, is that so bad? The clan already uses hallucinogen darts, flares, cardboard boxes, and mines. Are night vision goggles such a departure? Maybe you only want to minimize the loss of life, so you should kill yourself or else you'll slaughter the whole clan. But the clan is a group of assassins. Maybe the world would be better off if they were to go extinct. Is it even true that you'll kill everyone if you don't kill yourself? The story of the ink says you will, but Dosan stirs some doubt in even this. Maybe you'll eventually notice that if you kill those guards in the previous level, their corpses are other ninja. And I could go on. My point is that there's a lot to this ending. It's not some boilerplate progress versus tradition clashing, and it isn't left up to interpretation out of laziness. It's an intricate conflict, climaxing in one decision with no clear right answer. This really helps keep the narrative from getting old with repeat playthroughs. After you beat the game, you unlock New Game Plus. Given Mark of the Ninja's replayability, New Game Plus is a great idea. Unfortunately, its implementation leaves a lot to be desired. First off, it's not even a New Game Plus. I don't know what definition Clay would use, but I would define New Game Plus as starting the game over, but with all your upgrades and equipment from your last game. New Game Plus does do this, but so does the regular New Game. New Game Plus should have been called Hard Mode, since that's what it is. But that misnomer is not my only problem with New Game Plus. Let's look at each difference between it and the base game. Tutorial messages are removed. This is the simplest change and the one I most support, since people replaying the game probably don't need to be told what each button does again. The enemies are supposedly smarter or more aggressive. Personally, I could not tell the difference. The enemies felt the same to me. Enemy damage is increased. Now, most anything is a one-hit kill. This change is rather pointless since most players will want to restart checkpoint whenever they're spotted anyway. Indicators for enemy sight and smell have been removed. I would argue these indicators are a large part of what makes this game great since they remove a lot of guesswork on the part of the player. This change seems like a disaster, but actually turns out fine in practice. Since getting to a new game plus requires beating the game, the player has hopefully developed a feel for the enemies by then. Even so, turning a corner only to be immediately spotted because you can't see what the enemy sees is irritating. Last change, you now have a vision cone wherever you face. The other 75% of the screen is a blurry mess. This change seems like a disaster, but actually is a disaster. It's an annoyance, not a challenge, to have to constantly, manually, look around you. Maybe this could work if it was consistent. Looking left or right works fine, but you're sometimes not allowed to look up or down. For example, when hiding behind anything, you can't look down. Quite simply, it's not fun to micromanage your eyeballs. The running theme in these changes is that they don't change how you play, aside from using Farsight more often. In an ideal world, hard mode would feature entirely new enemy placements or even entirely new levels. This probably isn't practical, but an economical hard mode still could have been more fun. Simply adding more enemies could have sufficed, or increasing the scores necessary to achieve 3 stars. Of course, the mediocrity of New Game Plus is hardly a big problem since it's an alternative game mode anyway. Lastly, I'd like to discuss some things I couldn't find a place for earlier. Every stealth kill creates a quick time event. If you succeed, then it goes fine. If you fail, you gain less points and make a lot of noise. Considering this mechanic affects nearly every kill you get, and you kill a lot, I feel like I should have more thoughts on this, but I'm kind of apathetic. 
These quick time events are easy enough that after getting a little practice, you're unlikely to fail them again. Also, if a player hates them enough, they can just equip the Path of the Hunter, which makes the events auto-succeed. The events should have just been removed from the game, since they don't add anything of value, and some players will obviously dislike them. Maybe at a certain point in the story you could gain an upgrade which would auto-succeed at them, signifying the Mark to Ninja's growing competence. It feels like the quick time events were just thrown into the game without much thought, which is surprising considering how well thought out the rest of the game is. The scrolls you find aren't just arbitrary collectibles. Each one can be read. Usually it's a haiku. I'm not into poetry, so I won't comment on their quality, but the scrolls definitely add to the atmosphere. By far the most interesting of these are the scrolls written by Master Azai, which present some of his side of the story. The credits for this game are terrible. It's basically just a big list of names with no roles. It doesn't tell you if a person is a voice actor, an animator, or the lead designer. The people behind Mark of the Ninja clearly did a good job, so it's disappointing to see them not receive proper credit. Lastly, I'd like to comment on the unfavorable comparisons I've made to other games. My thoughts on these other games probably came off more negatively than I intended. The thing is, some of these games are very enjoyable, although some I genuinely do hate. But I've said too much. Thank <laughs> you.